Uh, so we were uh, assigned on November 3rd, 2008, about 14 months before the mission. And uh, we'd come from our various assignments within the office and started training. Uh, of course, uh, training for space, we don't have space here on Earth, so we use various uh, classrooms to help teach different parts of the mission. Uh, the T-38 on a hot, steamy day with a <laughs> thunderstorm maybe brewing out is uh, one such classroom. Uh, we also do training in uh, many simulators. This is the SES Dome, uh, where we practice the visual part of the rendezvous. Uh, and there are many, the whole crew's involved in that. Uh, we also use the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, a big pool, 40 feet deep, and this is where Nick and Bob uh, rehearse their spacewalks, and uh, you can see them suiting up there. Uh, fast forward to February 8th. Uh, this was our second try at launch. Uh, we had a weather scrub the first day. Around midnight, uh, we came on out after getting ready in our suits and hearing a, a, an encouraging weather report. And uh, this is the launch. If you look in the lower left side, you'll see what it looks like going out the front window. This is a new view, so pay attention to the lower left as well. Okay, there was a cloud deck in front of us, and you can see us pop right through those clouds. On the other side, you can see uh, we made kind of a star in the shape of a cupola as we were heading up. So here we had about 7 million pounds of thrust, uh, pushing uh, what started out being a 4 million pound vehicle. Uh, at Mach 5, at about 150,000 feet, the solid rocket boosters had done their job and they separated and they continued up to about 200,000 feet before floating down on parachutes while we continued on. Uh, our powered flight was about eight and a half minutes and here you'll see uh, the last part of it, we're under three G's. So you'll see we kind of look a little strained there. And then you'll, right there is when we go to zero G and ah, we relax and we can start moving around a little bit. And then uh, it was time for us to get off the tank. The tank started out with about a million pounds of propellant, uh, very cold cryogenic propellant. And you'll see it separate from the bottom of the, of the shuttle. Uh, there's the separation. The shuttle separates and moves away. We continue on up to orbit while the tank uh, returns to Earth. Uh, you'll see we were flying east, so we flew into morning, and uh, there was a morning on the tank, and we took some uh, video of it as it uh, went on down, and then later got configured for uh, for our business in space. So we got into comfy clothes, set up our laptops, and uh, we're ready to go. That external tank you saw earlier can shed foam, which could damage the shuttle's uh, wing's leading edges. So we use the uh, robot arm on the shuttle and the long boom you see here, which has a laser camera system to inspect the leading edges of the wings and the nose cone. This is the kind of view the laser camera provides of the wing's leading edge. And here's a thruster on the nose of the shuttle. Unfortunately, Endeavour was in great condition after launch. Flight day three is rendezvous day. Very exciting. We've got uh, two spacecraft about 200 miles above the Earth going at five miles a second. And we've got to get them uh, joined up in a, uh, a polite manner. Uh, the whole crew's involved. Uh, Kay's using a handheld laser there. And that's what the space station looks like as we see it out the window and uh, try to get closer to it. On the space station, those are our space station crewmates who are going to take pictures of this. This is a backflip that we do about 500 feet below the space station uh, in order for them to take pictures of our tiles. Uh, and uh, this is done uh, very safely because uh, gravity is actually pulling us away and in front of the space station. So even though we're not looking at it, it uh, it's a neat thing to do. We do have a view of what that looks like from inside. This is looking out the back windows of the space shuttle and you can see the station rising up over the tail. So that's, that's our viewpoint of that. And then, of course, the sun is right there. And the sun moves very quickly. The uh, final few seconds, we'll let you listen to what that sounds like. It's, it's uh, the eight, four, eight, four, three, two, contact. Capture light. Physical capture. Clock is started. Okay. Okay. 
All right, let's run down the card. Hey, damping is so it's a little a little jerky and, and sudden, but uh, it's sure nice to know that you're connected to the space station. Then we uh, opened up the hatches and visited with our space station buddies. That's Jeff Williams. He's the commander of the uh, the increment. He just returned. He's back on Earth with us now. There's all like Kutov, one of our cosmonaut buddies, T.J. Kramer, and uh, let's see, also up there was Soichi Noguchi and uh, Max Surayev. So we went from a crew of six to a joint crew of 11 to start putting uh, the cupola and node three up on the space station. One of our main tasks, or big tasks that we had to do was robotic operations. Kay and I used the space station arm to remove node three and the cupola, which were attached together from the shuttle payload bay. And uh, we moved them around and attached them to the space station. That maneuver right there took about two and a half hours in space. Uh, and here you can see us grabbing it in the shuttle payload bay and pulling it out. We moved it uh, to the node one port side, which is the left side of the space station in about the middle area there. The views that we have are all from video cameras. At the When we did this, we did not have any windows to look out. And there you can see the node three in the final uh, attachment phase. After a few days, we took cupola, moved it off the end of node three, and attached it to the bottom of Node 3, or the Nader Earth-facing side. And in these views, you can see how crowded it is outside. There's uh, several modules and different robotic arms sticking out, so it's a busy environment to do robotics in. We had one uh, more large operation. Bob and Nick used the uh, robotic arm again to move a small station module called PMA-3, and they took that from the front top of the station and moved it back to where the cupola had launched from the side of, uh, of node three. And out the cupola window, you had this view for the first time of robotic operation. We were taking the shuttle sensor boom and putting it in the undock location. We had the luxury, um, as we prepared for our upcoming spacewalks, of a day and a half to prepare tools and for Nick and I to get things ready before going into our camp out procedures uh, in the station airlock. After spending the night, uh, we came out with our special underwear and our special air uh, to get ready for the first day's spacewalk. You can see Nick and I both getting suited up here with the help of uh, George. You saw Jeff uh, help, help us uh, get into our suits a little bit earlier, and you can see uh, TJ there helping us get into the airlock before going out for the first spacewalk. Here Nick and I are closing up the thermal cover up on the airlock before heading out to Node 3 in the shuttle payload bay to start removing some of the hardware that uh, launched, protective hardware that had to be removed before we could mount Node 3 to the space station. What you can see there is the seal, the sealing surface that keeps the uh, atmosphere of the space station inside the space station. And uh, we're really happy there was a nice protective seal on there. We also had to unplug Node 3 from the payload bay where it was getting its power. There's the extension cable. It's a little hard to manage in weightlessness, as you can see. And in this next view, you'll see Bob and I heading back to the space station. Here's Bob translating along node three towards the front of the shuttle. And if you look way up in the back, you can just see me translating up node two towards the airlock. Our air traffic controller inside was Steve Robinson, did a wonderful job talking to us and keeping us on track on the timeline of the EVA. And here we are plugging node three into its new home on the port side of node one. You can see the cables behaving like snakes. At the uh, end of EVA-1, Nick mentioned that we hooked up power to Node 3 from the space station. For EVA-2, what we did after closing this uh, thermal cover again was to hook up the cooling system for Node 3. Basically, we took high-pressure ammonia lines and uh, mounted them from the U.S. laboratory over to Node 3. They had to be encased in some special insulation, and all this hardware was quite a bit bigger than uh, Nick and I were. Uh, these ammonia lines were actually really problematic, and kudos to the team that uh, got them together and actually got them on board our flight uh, so we could install them. You can see here a, a, a great view uh, looking back down onto the final configuration of one of those blankets that covered those lines uh, as Nick and I were outside doing the final cleanup before getting ready to head back in and start preparing for EVA-3. Our third spacewalk focused on the cupola. Here, Bob and I are removing the insulation that it launched in to uh, expose those metal shutters over the windows. After the insulation was removed, uh, we could unbolt the windows. Those bolts were designed to stop the windows coming open inside the shuttle's payload bay during launch. After each EVA, it's time to squeeze back into the airlock. This time, it's just Bob and I getting in without help 
and we have to manage all of our bags in the airlock there. And at the end, we get to come back into Space Station, which is great. After a long EVA, we get our first, uh, first real drink and some food in about eight hours, and we get to scratch our noses for the first time. Our EVA members were outside configuring the cooling lines and the data and power cables on the outside of Node 3. We had to get busy on the inside of Node 3, setting up all the environmental control and life support and crew systems. You see us uh, here. We carried up about 750 pounds of cargo inside of Node 3, and we had to unstow that and then get busy setting up all the different systems. These systems are very important and critical to sustaining a crew of six people on board the International Space Station. Here you see Bob outside working away while we were working inside to set up uh, air revitali uh, revitalization systems and water recovery systems. And also, we're setting up a treadmill and also a weightlifting machine, which is quite tricky in the microgravity of space. We also had to set up the inside of the cupola to get that all ready to go, and setting up all the different components to be able to provide this new capability. Here you see uh, Stevie Ray working on some of the fluid lines on the uh, for the waste hygiene compartment, uh, turning uh, yesterday's coffee into uh, tomorrow's water. <laughs> <laughs> Very important for the long duration uh, life of the International Space Station. So as you can see, Node 3 is quite busy here, but as we got all these racks moved, it was time to go ahead and have the official ribbon cutting ceremony and officially open Node 3 for business. One of the most important reasons for going into space is to do sophisticated experiments. <laughs> in human physiology. <laughs> and also, uh, complex physics. This may look like fun, but it's actually very detailed <laughs> observation of physical properties. One of the great advantages of doing uh, science in, in space is that um, many of the experiments are edible. Some more than others. <laughs> you can see different sized satellites uh, develop different orbital trajectories. <laughs> uh, s sleeping, we, we, we did some of that every day. And uh, there's a lot going on, so we tied ourselves in sleeping bags and put on uh, sleep masks. Of course, exercise is important also. And it's a little known fact that space makes your legs um, very pale and skinny. Various uh, nonlinear uh, fluid mechanics, uh, viscoelastic properties are important in space, especially when they're. Uh, <laughs> when they're combined with other, uh, other surfaces. And again, uh, thank goodness many of the science uh, experiments are edible. Translating in space as a free body is something you have to, it takes planning and skill. And uh, again, Exercise and, and the effects it has on, on a person's um <laughs> we, uh, uh, we ra had a rare occasion to find everybody on the space station and the space shuttle and have a meal together, which was really fun because it's an international crew and we had different, different uh, experiences and backgrounds, but also different food. So we had uh, Russian food and American food and Japanese food, and we got together to share stories and food together. After an enjoyable meal together, but all too short, it was time to get back to work with the cupola, and we were finally able to open the shutters for the first time and look out the window. Here we're looking out the large center window. There's a, the crescent moon that we saw, and we had new views of the exterior of the International Space Station that we had never been able to see before just by looking out a window. Here we are looking out some of the additional windows. There's seven windows, one right in the center and then six around the edges of the cupola to provide us a 360 degree panoramic view that is just stunning. The cupola will be used as a robotic uh, workstation for the robotic operators and especially as we move into the future with new vehicles that will be visiting the International Space Station, it will be important to be able to look out the window to see that view versus just relying on the camera views that we have. And of course we just get to look at our beautiful Earth out this window as well. Well after uh, 
almost nine days docked with the space station, we had to say goodbye and close the hatches. And uh, traditionally, the pilot gets to fly the undocking. I was very happy to get a chance to do that. Um, here's a shot of us separating from the station and backing away on the Physical separation. Physical separation. Okay. Mark. Mm -hmm. And pedals clear. I'm LBLH. On the flight deck, it's very crowded. All six of us are there doing either flying or uh, different tests there. Here's a view of sunrise, and you can see the uh, Endeavour shadow there on the top left. This was just spectacular. In space, it takes about uh, a little less than 15 seconds to go from black through pink and orange to bright white, and that's a view that you never get tired of seeing. Here's a view of Endeavour backing away, and uh, you can see how crowded it is there with all of us on the flight deck doing different tests and taking pictures. Uh, during the docking and rendezvous, I did not have a chance to see the station. I was busy in the front cockpit, so this is my first chance to see it. And here we are flying over Mount Everest. It was, uh, it was just amazing. Mount Everest is the tallest mountain down there. Um, <laughs> Just a beautiful view, uh, impossible to describe. After two weeks in space, the mid-deck, which is where we'd been sleeping, eating, and, and generally living, had become quite messy, and we spent the best part of the day uh, tidying it up and getting it ready for re-entry, packing our things away. Then uh, Steve and Kay closed the payload bay doors to streamline the shuttle for re-entry, and then it was time for us to literally get suited up and get ready to come home. And you can see the, the final suit up uh, flight deck crew member, Steve Robinson, as uh, Nick and I wrestled him into his suit after uh, almost two weeks on orbit. We did our deorbit burn over the Indian Ocean and uh, did our re-entry, and because it was at night, we could see the tangerine orange glow of the uh, of the plasma around the uh, shuttle as we were uh, entering and uh, had a pretty neat light show. Weather was a concern, but it was a beautiful night uh, as it turned out at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we're about 2,000 feet here pulling up for landing and uh, there's the runway. Uh, about here I, I asked Terry uh, if this was the right place. Did, it didn't look that familiar. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but well, I don't see the people. Anyway. <coughs> So uh, we touched down about 10.20 on a Sunday night, and uh, it was wonderful to be back at the Kennedy Space Center where we started our, our great adventure. And uh, what was really neat was walking around the, uh, the shuttle afterwards, just an amazing machine, and we had all the people uh, looking at it and tending to it, and um, then we were looking very much forward to some good food and a hot shower. And we were mission complete and back to our ordinary lives back here on Earth. Storm may be brewing out is uh, one such classroom. Uh, we also do training in uh, many simulators. This is the SES dome uh, where we practice the visual part of the rendezvous. Uh, and there are many, the whole crew is involved in that. Uh, we also use the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, a big pool, 40 feet deep, and this is where Nick and Bob uh, rehearse their spacewalks, and uh, you can see them suiting up there. Uh, fast forward to February 8th. Uh, this was our second try at launch. Uh, we had a weather scrub the first day. Around midnight, uh, we came on out after getting ready in our suits and hearing a, a, an encouraging weather report. And uh, this is the launch. If you look in the lower left side, you'll see what it looks like going out the front window. This is a new view, so pay attention to the lower left as well. Okay, there was a cloud deck in front of us. And you uh, so we were uh, assigned on November 3rd, 2008, about 14 months before the mission, and uh, we'd come from our various assignments within the office and started training. Uh, of course, uh, training for space, we don't have space here on Earth, so we use various uh, classrooms to help teach different parts of the mission. Uh, the T-38 on a hot, steamy day with a thunder you can see us pop right through those clouds.
on the other side, you can see uh, we've made kind of a star in the shape of a cupola as we were heading up.